All right, we're live. Welcome to the COVID-313 Coalition for Families and Students. I'm Christine Bell. I'm so happy to be here with you again today. Uh, I am honored to serve as the Executive Director of UNI. I'm a really proud member of this coalition and probably most importantly, not probably, most importantly, I'm the mom of three really wonderful children. Um, I get so much out of our town halls and we've got a really amazing show for you today, or I should say town hall today. Um, please remember that this is not just our town hall, it is the collective, our town hall. So we really want to hear from you. So we've got folks uh, watching the chat, Brooke and Amy, and they are waiting to hear from you. Uh, so please let's uh, make sure that they are, they are there. And why don't you uh, just drop in the chat on Facebook where you're joining us from today. And, and also tell us what do you wanna hear about uh, in the future? Like always, we're translating the town hall to Spanish and ASL. So we want to give folks time to get to the right place. Ophelia, it's awesome to have you with us again today. Can you please give us the details on how to listen to Spanish interpretation? Yes, thank you. Si gustan ver este video en español, pueden ver en el chat. Voy a poner en enlace o puedes ir al Facebook de Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation y ahí vamos a estar haciendo el video en vivo. Y traduciendo, hoy será uh, traducida por yo, Felipe Torres, y la señora Gloria Rojas. Thank you so much, Ophelia, and thank you, Gloria, um, for being with us today and doing our interpretation. Uh, Julie is here with us again today. Thank you for being here. Julie, will you please share um, the instructions for ASL interpretation? Thank you so much, Julie. And I am now going to pass the mic to one of my co-moderators, Miss Jametta Lilly. Jametta? Thank you. I'm grabbing the mic. <laughs> uh, thanks, Christine. And it's always a joy to be with all of the families that and individuals who tune into our COVID-313 town hall. Uh, I believe we may be on program number 67 or 68. Um, and I'm blessed to have been with this work from the beginning. My name is Jametta Lilly, and I am just so blessed to serve as the CEO of the Detroit Parent Network. I'm a Detroiter, I'm a Nana, a mom, and so important, I'm just like all of you that we are stepping up to make sure that our community is safe, uh, not only through COVID, because it's still here, it's still here, uh, but also pandemic, we, we're all here to love and support on each other. But really consistent with it, we, uh, to what uh, was just said, Christine, we want to hear from you. And I wanna thank all of you that participated in our COVID-313 town hall survey. We had lots of you complete that survey. And you might recall that we were also offering uh, $25 gift cards as part of that survey. So we are tabulating those names, we'll be doing the drawing and we will announce next week uh, who the winners were of that incentive of a $25 gift card. There were 10 people for that, uh, for sharing your thoughts, your opinions about how we can make this COVID-313 town hall even more powerful. So, but before we dive into the program, speaking of power, uh, we consistently say is that our voices matter, our voices of everyone in our community must be heard. And we need to do that through the mechanism of voting. So as you all know, there's an upcoming election, August the 3rd, and we want to be sure that you have done everything that you can to be ready if you haven't already submitted your absentee ballot that you can get ready to participate. Um, I believe that we have a sample of what that ballot looks like. Uh, if we can pull that up, yes. Now, uh, families, there's a couple things to keep in mind. First, 
Michigan and Detroit in particular, uh, we don't have any limitations on, on, on our voting. Please don't think because of, of the horrific things that you're seeing to suppress the vote in other cities that we don't have enough poll places or enough places for you to put your absentee ballots. Uh, that is not an issue. So as you can see on the screen is an electronic version of the ballot. Everyone has the opportunity to vote, obviously for our mayor, our city clerk, and depending upon where you live, you may have the ability to vote for a new council member at large or other positions. So really make sure that you take a look at your particular ballot. Uh, in addition to that, we all are gonna have the opportunity to give our thoughts about Proposal P. Uh, some of you heard some of the information that we had in our last program. Uh, and unfortunately, we don't have that other voice today, but we encourage you, please make sure that you never just rely on commercials. We have to make sure that with COVID, we're telling the community, read, inform yourself, because knowledge is power. So thank you for having that copy of the ballot. And let's get ready to move into our program. And for our speakers, um, and all including moderators, let's remember to speak slowly for our translators. They are translating, um, and we want to make sure that that important information is there. In addition, uh, speakers, all of you, we've had a chance to talk to you about how much time is available. And in the event that you begin to run over, Terry Whitfield, our awesome timekeeper, will send you a little note to let you know at, if you're at one minute or if you're over. And by the same token, Christine and I would probably give you a reminder, but please keep your eye on the chat uh, while you're speaking. So today we're going to move into really important topics. We know that uh, we've got to keep our eye on COVID because COVID is still here and threatening our health and our wellness. Uh, but we also have been impacted with health issues as a result of the horrific and literally historic flooding that we've had in the metro area. So to bring us up first, though, we want to hear from the Detroit Health Department to give us uh, some really important information of where we are. Also in our programming today, we're so delighted to welcome back Dr. Valbuena uh, from CHAS, uh, which is one of our critical federally qualified health clinics out serving the community all the time. But I'm happy to be able to pass the baton or the mic again to uh, one of our co-moderators and just really phenomenal women that's part of this coalition. And that is Rajishri, Rajishri Bhatia if you will. Thanks, Jametta. Um, <clears throat> we'll first hear from uh, Tanea. Welcome back. And um, we'll go ahead and uh, I believe you have a slide that you want to share some information about and then we'll move on from there. No, I don't have a slide today. Um, just a lot, of course, thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you, Jametta. Thank you. Oh, it's always a pleasure to um, be able to give the current data and where Detroit is and the Detroit Health Department. So first, um, we can just keep talking about our data because we know Detroit is stronger together. And the only way we can continue to grow together is through education, collaboration, and continuing to work together. So right now, uh, the updates for Detroit, we are currently at 2.7% of being um, at our positive rate, which has gone up since last week. Last week, we're, we were in like 1.4, um, and we're, so you can see our numbers are starting to climb. Um, as far as Michigan right now, we're at 4.1. 4 that last week was lower. So we're, we're starting to climb just a little bit. And that's why we're out in the community with the Detroit Health Department. Um, we're at vaccination. We just, we're at businesses. We're at um, anywhere we can be. Schools, we have partnered with so many and anyone we can partner with churches. 
um, we are here and we're letting Detroit know we're here and we're visible wherever we can be. Um, because right now Detroit is 39.5% of being vaccinated. Again, it's important to bring these numbers up because we know our problem right now is the Delta variant. And right now, the proportion of COVID, the positivity of COVID, 78.9% of that is Delta. So that's a concern. So because Delta right now is more transmittable, it's um, um, a variant Yes, the vaccines are effective, so that's why we're encouraging and that's why we're out here with the Detroit Health Department encouraging vaccinations to call the nurses line at 313-4000 um, with option three and anyone can talk to a nurse. It's not just any nurse, it's my team. My team, we consist of five nurses. We do our own research. We work for the Detroit Health Department separately. And this is what we do. We educate. We go out. We want to spread as much education and outreach that we can so we can bring Detroit and make Detroit stronger. Um, the number for vaccination, to schedule vaccination, to find out where the vaccination sites are for transportation for vaccination, the number to call for homebound um, people that are at home and can't get out, their caregivers, anyone who lives in that home, COVID testing um, to register as a good neighbor, they, they're all the same number and that number is 313. 2300505. It's important to keep stressing what we know right now is to get Detroit vaccinated. Detroit, wear your mask, continue to social distance, continue hand hygiene. Yes, our numbers are low, but to keep them low and to make them even lower, we have to do this. We have to mask. We have to social distance. We have to keep taking care of each other. Detroit is only stronger together. Do you have any questions? I think right now, um, I don't see any questions, but I think that's always very informative and we appreciate uh, the, the message to uh, continue to mask up. Um, as you said, the, the variant has definitely uh, rearing its head amongst our community and we need to do what we need to do to try and contain it. So we appreciate, as always, your contributions and look forward to having you back on a future show. Thanks so much. Thank you so much. You guys have a great day. Thank you. Um, now we're going to move into um, our section where we have a physician joining us. So Dr. Valbuena, I see that you've taken off your video and are here. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us today and for um, sharing your expertise with us. Thank um, you, we're excited to be we're here. Gonna, we'd like to start off actually talking a little bit about the flooding. So I'm gonna invite my, um, my colleague, Brooke. Uh, Brooke's gonna join us and share with you a little bit about her experience and then ask a few questions um, of you at the end. So Brooke, there you are, take it away. Hi everyone, um, thank you Dr. Valbuena for joining us today. Um, you know. Right now, South or all of Michigan has been hit with some pretty severe weather. You know, we keep see, having really bad storms. We keep seeing more and more cases of flooding going on in homes. So today, um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what's going on at home with me and my family, um, and how we've been affected um, from the flooding. So if we've been affected, I'm pretty sure you know other families out there are suffering. Um, so just a little backstory. So our our home just flooded back when we had the initial bad storm around the end of June. Uh, we probably had roughly maybe two to three inches of water in our basement. Uh, we quickly managed to get the water out. We had fans going and we had a dehumidifier going. However, once we finished up with cleanup, um, I have a three-year-old, his name is Lionel. Um, and I noticed that he had a really bad cold going on. And, you know, it took him about a week, a week and a half for it to 
to um, clear through. However, like once I thought he was out of the cold, one morning he broke out covered in hives. And as a first time mom, I freaked out. I rushed him over to a children's hospital where the doctor told us that he was having an allergic reaction to something. Um, the doctor asked us, you know, have we introduced anything new, any new foods, detergents, lotions? And I'm like, no, you know, um, everything has been the same at home. And so the doctor, you know, she, well, it's in order, because he was covered head to toe in hives. I'm going to show you guys a picture. I'm not sure how clear it'll be. Um, but he, his little body was just covered in red inflamed hives, you know, head to toe. Um, he was itchy. He, he was uncomfortable. And um, so the doctor gave him a dose of Benadryl, you know, because we didn't know what was triggering it. He asked us to go see an allergy specialist, in which we did. And so they conducted, you know, the, the test where they poked their backs with like a 30 bunch of different allergies that he could be allergic to. And as a result, it turned out that he is very allergic to mold, mold and dampness. I don't know the technical names of it. Um, and so I also, I happened to mention to the specialist that um, our, our house had been flooding due to this, um, with all the rain that we're getting. And she thinks it's, um, that's what's causing it. And so his hives have been coming, they've been, they flare up and they go away. They flare up and they go away. So we've been, you know, on a steady dose of Benadryl, of Zyrtec, just to try to get him comfortable. Um, I like to do a lot of like natural remedies. So I've been doing a lot of oat baths, um, chamomile baths, manzanilla, mm -hmm. and um, just to try to get him comfortable. But after that initial flooding, our house is flooded two more times, right? So it's, this is an ongoing occurrence. Right. And what are we seeing? He keeps flaring up. Um, so as a result, we are now looking into getting a professional into our home to get um, to get all of this mold or mildew that's going on. I thought we had gotten most of it out because, you know, we were quick to um, clean everything, you know, get it all clean, get it sanitized, have bleach. But a lot of the, our home is pretty, I mean, it was built like in the 1919. So this is an older house. Right. And you know, in Southwest Detroit, a lot of our homes are on the older side and a lot of people are dealing with flooding. Is this normal or we see or like what should people be on the lookout for? Yeah, the flooding is challenging regardless of how old the, the, the home is or how old the, the structure is, let's say. And, you know, aside from the, the obvious um, things of, you know, some of that water can have, you know, human waste, um, can have, you know, chemicals in it. Everything that's underneath that level of the water is also a risk. So physical objects that might be under there and, and um, um, cutting or hurting, you know, yourself, uh, infections of those wounds if you, if you get injured when you're, you know, uh, with the water, in the water, uh, skin rashes like your son, um, gastrointestinal illness. So if, if somehow that um, touches something that then you're going to um, touch to eat, um, and then some other, some other infections, you know, are, are, are possible. The challenge is that mold um, thrives and grows and lives in a moist environment. So unless that moisture is out in 24 to 48 hours, um, the, the clock starts ticking and the mold can start um, growing. And you don't necessarily see that uh, right away. That could be in the walls. From previous moisture, so if the you know if the house is was built if the house was built in 1919, there's a risk that in in, in the structure of the house from rain, you know, um, the gutters and those things that that there's moisture that has been in there previously, that then you have um, uh, mold uh, growing, and then that was exacerbated or, or made worse by the flooding and the moisture that, that uh, was in that two or three inches of, of water. Um, and then the two subsequent times, um, because of the fact that um, mold loves and grows and thrives in moisture. So the key is always to have <clears throat> the moisture under control. You know, basements tend to have more moisture. And so just having a dehumidifier, um, like you said, you have now to, to help control that moisture on, in an ongoing basis is, is an ideal situation. Um, at this point, um, you know, if, if you've been flooded three times and, and your son is still having those reactions and they feel that it's related to the mold, you know, it's gonna require um, more uh, professional um, um, 
individuals to come in and, and actually look behind um, underneath the, the flooring, uh, if it's you know if it's carpeting or or, uh, or wood, and and then in in the walls to uh, to identify and, and eradicate it because until it's completely eradicated, that will be a challenge uh, for your son because of the the, the allergies that um, that that uh, he has to to uh, to the mold, and then people who have their immune systems that are a little bit um, suppressed because of certain medical conditions or certain medications that they take as well as uh, people who suffer from asthma. Uh, this can be a significant trigger uh, for their asthma to, um, to uh, flare up, let's say. Thank you so much, Dr. Brooke. Hopefully that's helpful to you and your son, um, who we all you know, hope gets better and, and you can get past this now. But um, thank you so much for that really comprehensive answer. I think it really, it helps not just Brooks, but other moms in her in her shoes. So um, I also wanted to invite our colleague, Akila. Akila has a similar um, experience and had a couple of questions for you as well. Go ahead, Akila. Hi, Akila. Hi, Dr. Valbuena, and thank you, Rajay Cherie. Um, again, my name is Akila, and I am Deputy Director with Mothering Justice, but I am also a severe asthmatic. Um, I've had asthma since I was nine years old, and um, recently, within the last couple of years, we had some water enter into our basement that was not necessarily flood related. Um, but the carpet got wet and, you know, we tried to, you know, vacuum it up and we tried to figure out how we can salvage things. And within maybe just one or two days, I started to have back to back asthma attacks and I just couldn't figure out what it was because I didn't. I didn't smell anything. I didn't see anything. And the water wasn't even there for that long. And the my asthma symptoms didn't subside until we actually ripped up the carpet and then used bleach and water to clean the concrete underneath and threw everything away. Um, but I know there are so many families, especially in the Black community, who are impacted with asthma and severe allergies. And a lot of those families live in poverty and low income neighborhoods and also have been impacted by the recent flooding multiple times, similar to what Brick shared. Um, but I would like to know what folks should look for when it comes to the impact that mold can, and mildew can have on asthmatics, um, because you can't always see the spores. And I don't think a lot of people know that even though it was in the basement, those things travel through the air. So what, what should folks look for to know if maybe they need to be concerned about that? Yeah, unfortunately, because you can't always see it and you, and you can't smell it, um, it takes somebody who has one of those uh, conditions like your asthma or um, uh, sensitive to, to, aller to allergens, we call it, to actually have symptoms before you really, really know. Uh, but you can be almost certain that anything that is porous and um, and and is moist for um, a, a 24 to 48 period of time will automatically be um, a breeding ground um, for the mold. And so, in the event, well, you know, I mentioned already, um, basements in general tend to be moist. So just having a dehumidifier that is that is going on, um, you know, for a certain period of time every day. To get that moisture out is one thing to try and help, you know, keep uh, the, the humidity under control, the moisture under control. But then if there's an event where there's water, you know, water pipe breaks or, or the flooding that we've gotten from, from, uh, from the rain, um, it's, it's, you know, cleaning up as quickly as possible. And those things that are porous, you know, if it's not a concrete floor, you have carpeting and there's padding underneath there, is you have to get that, get that up um, and you have to have uh, good ventilation. You have to have fans to dry things, you know, really quickly, um, because it, you know, it doesn't smell necessarily, and and you don't always see it. It's 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 deep. Uh, it's not on the surface. You know, sometimes you'll see it on the walls, on the drywall. If the if, if um, the basement is uh, is drywall, you'll see a little bit of um, um, moisture, and then and then uh, you know you may start seeing some darker um, color. It you know would be a trigger, but but you almost. Uh, certain that there's going to be something there, um, even if you can't smell it and you can't um, uh, see it, 
if there has been a significant amount of moisture um, in the area uh, for, you know, 48, uh, they're saying, you know, CDC says 48 hours, you should have, try and have everything clean and dry and sanitized. Um, and those things that you can't, you know, you, you, you have to, you, that, that are, are not amenable to being sanitized um, have to be, have to be disposed of and, and, you know, hopefully insurance. And I know that there's, um, there's assistance uh, from the government um, that, that has been brought in to, to help uh, replace some of those things. At the same time that we're working with um, our, our cities uh, to, to try and get uh, the infrastructure that we need in place um, to you know, hopefully mitigate and, and prevent some of these events from happening. But, but you know, the short answer to your question is we sometimes don't know and it takes somebody that has a medical condition that's gonna to react to that for it to, for it to trigger. Thanks so much, Doctor. Um, and thank you, Akila and Brooke, both of you for sharing your experiences and asking um, some great questions to get our conversation started. Um, so both of them mentioned specific symptoms, right? Brooke talked about hives for her son. Mm -hmm. Akila talked about an asthma sort of attack, if you will. Mm -hmm. What are other, um, other symptoms or other things that people might be experiencing if they are triggered by mold or earth? That's yeah. an issue. It's generally, it's generally the symptoms of an allergic reaction and you can have an allergic reaction on your skin. So you can have, you know, different rashes come up, you can have hives and then, and then in, in, in your respiratory tract. So you, you have sneezing and you have, uh, you can have runny uh, nose and watery eyes. Anything that would, would, um, would be similar to having uh, either a cold or, or an allergic reaction to something. And, and that's mainly gonna be your respiratory tract and, and your skin. Um, you know, with the flooding, there is a risk of, of infection and uh, um, not only on the skin, um, but also in, in your GI tract. So if you're touching something mm -hmm. that has been in contact with, with, with human waste that then touches something that you end up putting in your mouth, you know, there's a risk for, for uh, bacterial infections that would give you, would give you diarrhea. But uh, um, specifically for mold, um, it would be allergic type reactions, uh, which would mainly be um, upper respiratory uh, symptoms like like a cold um, or skin um, uh, reactions, which is, is another another uh, reaction to allergies. Okay, and are there populations we talked about already? You know, some 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 conditions that might be more susceptible, but are there specific? You know, can you can you just name some 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 people who might be more vulnerable to this? Are kids more vulnerable than adults, for example? Um, what are other sort of um, risk factors, if you will? Yeah, so um, what we call um, conditions that depress your immune system. So somebody who has cancer, very, very, very small babies, um, their immune systems aren't as, as well developed yet. And so they're, they're, they're at a higher risk. People that take medications for conditions um, that are called autoimmune conditions. So um, lupus uh, is, a, is a fairly common one, rheumatoid arthritis, and the medication that I'm, that I, the main one that I'm thinking of is, is uh, prednisone. And so that is a steroid medication that depresses our immune system. And there's many other, you, I'm sure you see in commercials, medications that are out there to help control our immune system that tends to flare in some of these, what we call autoimmune uh, conditions where your body basically attacks different parts of your body. So those individuals will have a depressed, a, a lower immune response to things. So they're at a higher risk. You know, and this is obviously uh, over and above those that tend to have what we call allergic rhinitis. So I suffer from that. It's just a, you know, hay fever from, from uh, pollen and things uh, as the seasons change to, you know, things as, as life-threatening as, uh, as asthma. Um, so basically conditions that we're going to bring your immune system down, which could be uh, medical conditions or could be medications that we take to help control um, mm -hmm. um, medical conditions. Yeah, so it sounds like for those folks, especially when it rains, it pours. Um, yes. <laughs> no pun intended here when I'm we're talking good. about flooding I'm and mold. Good. But yeah. um, so, you know, one of the things that Akila mentioned, and I just kind of want to get, you know, hear, have our audience hear you say it, you know, when, when we're cleaning up after these, these issues, these disasters, mm -hmm. it's really hard sometimes because we're tired and, and, you know, and then it also becomes challenging when we have to start parting with things that 
we don't want to part with, right? It's expensive and we can't always afford to replace it. But if I'm hearing you correctly, I mean, I think that our, I just want you to share with, with our audience how important it is to do that because of the risks to the health, right? So, you know, if you can just share a little bit, because you did mention that yeah. there might be old mold that yeah. gets re-triggered. So if you could talk a little bit about the health risks of, of that and why it's important we clear it all out when we can. Right. So, so in, especially in this time of the, the, the flooding that we have, you know, you definitely want to protect yourself if you have to get into the, into the water. Um, everything that, that's in contact with it, you need to disinfect. And if that's, you know, clothes that you're going to wash um, in, in, in the, with, with, you know, warm water and hot water and soap, uh, um, laundry soap to, to, uh, to disinfect it, as well as using uh, bleach for surfaces that you can clean, you know, the kids' toys, things that are solid. Um, but those that are porous that you can't throw in the washer or that you can't um, disinfect appropriately, unfortunately, it's, 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 a, it's, it's going to be a breeding ground. It's going to be a breeding ground for the, for the mold. And, and um, you know, we, we have to dispose of it. It, it has to be um, disposed because you can't um, clean it thoroughly enough, disinfect it thoroughly enough right. um, to be able to know that you've, you know, um, gotten all the uh, bacteria and, and, and mold and, and different things that, that uh, could be there that would end up infecting you um, afterwards. And then, um, you know, unfortunately have to replace those. Yeah. No, I have experienced that myself. I had to uh, throw out some family heirlooms, we'll call them, um, because of the mold. And, and it was one of those things, you can't donate it. You can't, give, you can't give it away no. because you're just transferring the problems that we have to throw it away, which is, which is challenging. And it's emotionally challenging. It's also for some folks financially challenging. But what you shared with us is it's far better to get rid of it and either live without or find another solution uh, than it is to keep it in our homes and have it continue to infect us and our kids. So I appreciate right. that. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly, as you talked about how um, how we sometimes see the spores get into the body, a lot of what you mentioned, you know, it reminds me of the, the same way we talked about COVID, right? We touch something and we touch our mouths or we touch our eyes. And so kind of moving into the COVID conversation, mm -hmm. um, tell us a little bit about, you're out in the community, you're serving, you're serving our community. What are you seeing um, out there with respect to, to COVID and especially with respect to this variant? Yeah, so we've been, we've been um, fairly successful in getting individuals uh, vaccinated, but we still have a ways to go. And this Delta variant is, is proving to be a very, very uh, formidable, um, challenger, much more so than the initial um, COVID-19 um, um, variant or the, the, the alpha that, uh, that infected us. And so that's why you've seen in the last few days over the last week, um, the CDC coming out and starting to walk back that, uh, that um, incentive that we were using uh, for individuals at the beginning, get vaccinated, and you don't have to wear a mask anymore. Why? Because as we see individuals vaccinated and see more of the Delta variant spreading, we're starting to see that individuals that are fully vaccinated can harbor, can, can, can contract um, the Delta variant, have it in our respiratory tract. It's not gonna hurt us. So that's still very true that the exposure to the virus once you've been, including the Delta variant, once you've been completely vaccinated. So you have your two doses, two weeks have passed by, the risk of being hospitalized or dying from it are minimal. And we're still seeing that and we're, we're very excited about that. But the challenge is that now, because it looks like we can harbor it, we can, we, it can be in our bodies, in our respiratory tract, that those individuals that are not vaccinated, if we are around them, we can, spread it to them, and then they can have the negative outcomes that we saw last year with individuals that weren't vaccinated that contracted the, the virus. And, and, you know, not only adults that haven't been vaccinated, but those that can't be vaccinated yet, right? So we have the vaccine for 12 years of age and up. So those that are younger um, than, than 12 can't. And so if you have small children at home and you're fully vaccinated, but uh, you are out and about and you happen to be in contact with somebody who has the Delta variant, you can bring it home to them. And um, so that's why you're starting to see the CDC saying, and especially as we're getting closer to the fall, when 
influenza is going to be a challenge again. And who knows, we, there may be another variant that uh, arises um, while we work to get everybody vaccinated because we still have, you know, we still have a, a ways to go. And, and um, the terminology that's being used of the, now we have the pandemic of the unvaccinated, I think is, a, is, is not the way to necessarily, um, necessarily um, characterize where we are, but individuals that are not vaccinated need to be vaccinated, need to be vaccinated because this, this, this uh, Delta variant is spreading. Um, we're risking another variant after that one that may be even worse than that one and would take us to square one again where we would have to start vaccinating everybody um, again um, from, the, from the beginning. Mm -hmm. And so I can't stress enough the importance of um, having the one-on-one -on -one conversation with your healthcare provider, someone that's trusted uh, in, in the healthcare space and in, in your life and, and, and have all of your questions answered and get the, get the vaccine. You know, we're still offering the vaccine here at the center six days a week and on Saturdays out in the community in different places. Um, but we're seeing that um, the numbers have dropped. There has not been a day where nobody comes in for a vaccine, so that's good. Um, but it's taken the one-on-one -on -one conversation. I personally have been called, uh, patients come in and, and are ready to get it and say, you know, I'm not really sure. I still have a few questions, perfect. We get a healthcare provider um, to go sit with them and, and answer, answer questions, you know, what, what, what do you still, what is still um, concerning you that you do not want to get the vaccine? And, and that's how we've seen success. That one-on-one -on -one conversation with a trusted medical provider to answer all of the questions face-to-face -face, um, has really worked. And, and we've gotten individuals vaccinated. We're doing it, we're doing it uh, without appointments. So if you make an appointment, it's fine, but we're doing it without appointments. You do not have to be a, a, a Henry Ford or a CHAS patient. Um, you don't necessarily even have to have had your first vaccine um, with us or even in the country. We vaccinated a, 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 a patient who received her first Pfizer dose in Barranquilla, Colombia, who happened to be here, had her card, and we gave her a second dose of Pfizer. So we're, we're open to vaccinating everybody and anybody that wants um, to be vaccinated during business hours. We've received support from the federal government with the Moderna vaccine and actually from the Detroit Health Department with the Pfizer vaccine so that we have those two options available. And uh, um, I just can't stress enough the importance of getting us vaccinated. Doctor, uh, um, I'm gonna stop you for just yeah, a moment here. Sure, sure, uh, this is super helpful. And I wanna continue this conversation because I think your message is fantastic. Yeah. We have a guest on who um, we wanted to make sure we were sharing some resources regarding flooding. So if you could just take a pause with us for a moment sure. and let me no, invite, um, Russ, if you could please join us and share uh, share your information, we'd really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, and I, I, I I'm happy to join uh, your conversation. The uh, I, I'm serving uh, right now and working with the Detroit uh, Public Library's mobile uh, library unit, and we are going out into the neighborhoods most adversely affected by the flooding, and uh, we're putting, uh, giving people information and literature about filing for their claims uh, with the water department, with the Great Lakes Water Authority and with uh, FEMA. Uh, now, uh, I, I really emphasize to people the Great Lakes Water Authority because that is less well known as, a, as an entity that uh, should be, have claims filed with. And Great Lakes Water Authority was the entity responsible for making sure the pumps were working and uh, minimizing uh, is to the maximum degree any consequence of rainfall. Uh, and so today um, at one o'clock there from one to 2.30 we'll be at um, uh, on Jefferson Avenue in the Jefferson Hall Chalmers neighborhood uh, putting, it's actually a, a parking lot for uh, a Dollar General store, I think. Uh, and uh, we're gonna be set up there. Anybody can come in and uh, pick up the forms. They can fill them out there. We have laptops. Our mobile library also has printer, it has Wi-Fi, So people uh, are using our computers as well as uh, picking up the forms to fill out their applications and get them turned in. And we remind people for the city, the filing is due by August 9th. 
So, right. Okay, we're going to other neighborhoods. Uh, we started, uh, as you may know, in uh, the Delray community. We were at the Chass location on Saturday also, and uh, that's how we met. Uh, 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 and so we're going to continue uh, in whatever area where we're requested. We, what we do is we formally partner with a neighborhood sponsor who's committed to getting the word out uh, we don't just go and park wherever we choose. We, we respond to requests and the request can made, be made to the Detroit Public Library. Uh, and their main number is 481-1301 or 1302. Right. Thank you so much. And uh, thanks for sticking around with us. I know that you had a tight timeline, so we appreciate it. <laughs> It seems so, yeah, I am afraid so. I, I do want to add uh, to the valuable information that, uh, that uh, Felix is providing. When I, when I've, I used to work in the Detroit water system and I'm, uh, you know, uh, really very animated about the fixes being made. But when I've done mold cleanup, I use uh, a stronger than standard bleach uh, called germicidal bleach. And uh, I encourage people to look at that because I found when I use that solution, the mold just was gone in minutes. <laughs> and uh, you can get those, not, not every store carries germicidal bleach, but uh, I have found them say it like the Home Depots of the world. So uh, it's a stronger solution and you use it, uh, use it with gloves on, rubber gloves on because it's a strong bleach, okay? Thank you so much. Even sure. additional information, we appreciate that. Thanks again for sticking with us. Uh, I, I, I'm sorry, it's so short, but thank oh, you very much for understanding. Short but powerful, we appreciate that. Okay. Uh, doctor, yeah. let's have you come on back. We have a few uh, few additional questions for you. Um, yeah. And in fact, I had a bunch of questions, but to be honest, you answered them all, so excellent. So Christine, let me toss it to you to, to ask the questions that we've received from the audience. Yes, 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 okay. So this, there's two questions. One's related, I think, to the flooding and mold. Okay. And then the other is related to COVID. So okay. we'll go with the, the, the first about um, the mold. Okay. How do we protect our kids from mold? What should we look for? Yeah, so protecting the kids from the mold is, is, um, is challenging if you can't find it, if you can't see it. But if you're, you're in, a, in, a, in a setting uh, where um, there's moisture, um, it's working to get that that moisture. I think just as a as a as a standard, our basements should always have a dehumidifier. Um, there's different versions, and and um, you know there's some that aren't that that uh, that terribly expensive to be able to um, maintain a humidity level uh, in our basements that's that's lower, which will uh, keep mold away. Um, but but um, there isn't a good you know there really isn't a good answer to how am I going to identify the mold if you've been in if your home has been in a situation where there's been water or moisture for a significant period of time you have to look um, and look not just superficially because you may not see it and you won't smell it but you have to look um, deep to see um, if if there is and you know sometimes that involves a, a, a professional and I know that there's you know, challenges with costs and things like that. But um, that's the way to really, really know um, because you really don't want to wait to see if your child is one of those that has a, a depressed immune system or a reaction to, um, to uh, um, uh, allergens that then are going to have, you know, the, the, the symptoms um, or the flares that were, have been discussed and mentioned previous. So Dr. Falbuena, just for those of us that might not know what a depressed immune system means, yeah. What might like describe what that looks like if your child has a depressed immune system? Does that mean like they get sick a lot or? Well, what does it um, mean? newborns up until a year old, when, when your, your body starts creating uh, more, um, your immune system starts getting stronger, are, are obviously at a higher risk. And then um, individuals that are using medications like the asthmatics have to use a steroid inhaler. Um, sometimes that brings your immune system down. So in general, you know, healthy kids, your, 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 your child that, that, uh, you know, is going to the doctor and, and there's no issues, um, you know, on, on a schedule, um, they're eating, they're eating well and, uh, you know, are growing, developing appropriately. 
chances are they're not going to have they're not going to have a, a depressed immune system. But um, you know, you mentioned kids that that, that tend to get uh, recurrent ear infections or tend to get um, recurrent um, throat infections, uh, strep throat uh, infections. One, yeah, it could be because they're they're around not in COVID times, but previously and and hopefully soon around other children that uh, you know. Um, we'll, we'll spread that from, from child to child, but um, from st student to student. But if, if that's something to be on the lookout for, if, if your child has recurrent uh, infections or recurrent allergies, uh, recurrent um, symptoms of allergies, whether it's, it's sinus type, uh, respiratory type symptoms or, or on the skin are flags. Those are flags to, to go to your doctor and, and look into that to see what, what it could be. And that may be, um, you know, in, in these situations with the, the flooding, um, the trigger and the, the, the sign for parents to say, you know, there's probably something going on here that we need to, we need to investigate more, not just with the doctor, but at home. Right. So a dehumidifier to keep your, your basement dry, yeah. um, not cleaning, using a disinfectant. And I did not know that there was something called germal bleach. So that is new, yeah. um, but but cleaning and then you know if you can bringing a professional out to make sure that um, that there's no mold since you can't see it or smell it, um, and then parents just really paying attention to are there reoccurring sicknesses that your child is getting mm -hmm. or things that look like allergies like a runny nose, um, hives those kinds of things. You got it. Great. And then the last question, there has been talk of red orange areas. Is Wayne County one of those areas? If not, is wearing masks indoors required for vaccinated people in Wayne County? So I, I can't speak for the county. I can't speak for the city. Um, if you look at the map that they've been showing in the, in the news, uh, Michigan is in a moderate uh, risk right now. It's mainly in the south. Um, some areas out in the West, but, but, uh, and then just South of us. So, um, I think, uh, Indiana and Ohio are, are at a higher, um, level than we are risk level. Um, but right now, and you know, right now the goal should be to get family members, relatives, neighbors, friends, colleagues that aren't vaccinated, vaccinated. And if you're going to be indoors, um, in an area where there's other people that you don't know their, their, their vaccine status and where, you know, necessarily where they've been, I would wear a mask. You know, I, I, I hate to say it because that's, that's something that, uh, you know, we're trying to get away from and that we were, you know, I mentioned earth first thing, you know, we were incentivized, you know, if you get vaccinated and uh, then you don't have to wear a mask, but we're putting at risk, not us, but the individuals that aren't vaccinated yet that we're going to be around. So for example, at CHAS, you know, in, in healthcare, in healthcare, you have to wear a mask, whether you're an employer, you're a visitor or a patient. That, so that, that's a different kind of situation. But at the grocery store, at the restaurants, um, my recommendation is even if you're fully vaccinated, that, um, that, that, you, do, that you do wear a mask, um, you know, even though a lot of places aren't requiring it anymore. And it's to prevent contaminating, if you've been exposed to it, somebody who, transmitting it to somebody who's not vaccinated yet. So the incentive now is, Let's work to get the questions and the, 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 the hesitancy um, and the myths answered so we can get everybody vaccinated because that, that's, that's the goal. If we can get everybody vaccinated, we're going to be, or as close to everybody vaccinated, we're going to be where we need to be um, so that then, you know, masking won't, won't be an issue. So uh, wear a mask indoors if you don't know who you're around. Yes. <laughs> and they're that's, my, that's my yeah. personal recommendation. Um, right. because of the, the, the situation and, and it's to help individuals that aren't vaccinated yet. So, so bottom line is get people that aren't vaccinated, vaccinated, and we are open and we are welcome, uh, uh, welcoming everybody. And we'll, we'll sit and answer specific questions to get individuals over that, that hump to get the vaccine. Thank you so much, Dr. Valbuena. I know that you have patients. I have to patients now. Kind of Yep. So thank you so much for My your pleasure. time and your expertise. And if you haven't been vaccinated, head over to Chaz. We're waiting for uh, you. 
Yeah, they're waiting. They've got the vaccines waiting for you and they've got folks there that can answer your questions. Yes. Thank you so much, Dr. Valbuena. Thank you, everybody. Um, bye. Bye now. And next we have um, Miss Tanya Myers Phillips and she is going to talk with us today about housing and the vic eviction moratorium. So Tanya, welcome. It's so good to see you virtually, um, but take it away. Thank you so much, Christine. It's always good to see you even virtually. <laughs> so uh, that was a wonderful presentation. Um, just very, very useful information. So good afternoon to everyone. I'm going to bring a a brief update of what's going on right now concerning um, evictions. So I'll, I'll hit a couple of points pretty quickly and I will put a lot of links in the chat so um, you can have resources uh, for yourself and to the pass on to community members. So save, save the chat, lots of links coming. <laughs> well, um, what you Great. say, Christine? I'm going to say, Brooke and Amy, please mm -hmm. make sure you're taking the links out of our chat and dropping them into Facebook so all our folks can see them. Tanya, go ahead. Awesome. Awesome. Well, you know, the first piece of information is concerning the, the status of the moratorium. Right now, um, unfortunately, the moratorium, the federal uh, CDC moratorium has not been extended. So the last day of the eviction moratorium is July 31st, unless there is um, a shift in, in that decision at the federal level. So as of right now, July 31st is the date. Um, we know that there are a lot of individuals and people in our community that um, are are still struggling with rental assistance um, as a result of this pandemic. So we want to do all that we can to, to help. So the first thing everyone should know is that there is an eviction prevention hotline for the city of Detroit. And this coordinates all of the legal service agencies. Um, so if anyone you know, if anyone is struggling with um, rental assistance, if anyone is facing a court date, if anyone wants to speak to an attorney, please call that number. It will, um, you'll probably get a response quicker than contacting the individual agencies because um, everybody's working as hard as they can, but contact that central number so that you can get in touch with an attorney. So that is the Detroit Eviction Prevention Hotline. That's the first thing to know. The second thing to know is you can look up and find out if you have a case pending at the 36th District Court. Sometimes the register of action can be a little tricky to read, but if you're not quite sure and you want to just take a look, you can put your name in um, that link there. And if you have a case pending with 36th District Court, and I know the mail is kind of funny these days and not run out, running, um, you know, as we're accustomed to it running, if you think you have a court date, you're not quite sure, you can put your name in there and look it up. So do that, especially if, you know, communication with the landlord is, you know, not, not prompt. So that's another thing that you can do. Uh, people should also know that there is rental assistance money available. That's the bright spot. So right now, you can get uh, between 12 and 15 months of rental assistance, depending on your eligibility, your income qualifications. But there's money available. Um, agencies are working as quickly as they can to get that money processed. And, um, you know, unlike times past, you know, where there's been a shortage of funds available, you know, they're, they're paying off... Um, arrearages in the thousands, the thousands, the five, six, seven thousand sometime. And I'm not saying that to encourage anyone to be behind, but I'm saying if you're behind, there's resources, there's funds designated that um, should be spent by the end of the year to help um, get caught up. So if you have a case in court, then your attorneys will help you navigate that process 
just call that number. If you don't have a case in court, if your landlord has not filed an action, but you are behind, you can go to Wayne Metro and just um, click the link there. So you don't have, a, have to have a court case in process in order to access these funds. You can access them if you've received a notice, if you're behind, but you don't have to actually have a court case. So, so far, if you have a court case, you know, call the eviction prevention hotline, get legal help. If you don't have a court case, but you're still behind in your rental payments, click that link with Wayne Metro, get your application started, so you can get that rental assistance. The money is there. Um, other things to look for or just to give you an expectation of what is happening. If you receive a, a notice to go to court, don't miss your court date. Don't, okay? There are attorneys there that are willing and able to assist. Um, everyone, because we do have a shortage, so everyone probably won't get full legal representation, but you at least have the opportunity to speak to someone and get pointed in the right direction. And right now at the 36th District Court, all first hearings are being adjourned with the hope that that gives individuals more time to apply for rental assistance. So, you know, court can be intimidating, but please do not miss your court date. Go to court. Your first hearing will be adjourned. It'll probably be about 30 days, really. So you only get more time for going to court and you meet people who can help you going to court. So don't avoid the court date, go to court, okay? And couple that with putting in your request for eviction assistance. Now, there's um, other relief available if you live in an apartment or a building that's owned by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac. Unfortunately, that assistance um, expires on the 31st also, but since, they, since there are federally insured properties, a lot of times there is um, different, I'm getting a little bit of feedback, I don't know, it's kind of weird. Can everybody hear me okay? Thumbs up? Okay. Okay. So um, with a federally insured property, there are different um, incentives or forbearance programs available. So again, the BIC forbearance does expire on the 31st, but I'm going to pop links in the chat here to see if your rental unit or your home is insured by Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, because throughout the year, they have different um, programs or initiatives available to provide relief that are separate from the CDC. So look that up. And sometimes, particularly with homeowners built into the terms of your mortgage, a lot of times there's a right to forbearance assistance. So um, just check that out. And let's see what else do we want to hit in terms of links. I'm gonna give you two more links to know more help is on the way for homeowners, for land contract holders. A lot of times homeowners and land contract holders, like what, what kind of help can I get? Can I get a little help too? Everybody is struggling. There have been federal funds um, awarded. They are um, in MISTA right now. Um, they're working it out, but there's money coming for mortgage assistance, for land contract, um, um, not to buy a house, but if you're in arrears with your mortgage, if you're in arrears with a land contract, um, utilities, internet, uh, assistance is on the way. So check those links out in MISTA. It's going to look, um, I hate to use this analogy, but we remember what there, there was a step forward at some time, right? I'm not saying the program is going to look like that. I hope it doesn't look like that. But the idea is money is going to be available through MISTA, um, hopefully in the fall. You know, I'm hearing end of September, but I put the links there. So if you're a homeowner, you know people who have a land contract, again, don't go to, don't miss your court date. Hang on, hold on, get that sucker adjourned, talk to your attorney and try and hold out for this money, okay? So keep an eye on that. And finally, and I have to hop, hop off in just a second here. I just want to 
um, layer on with the flood situation. Um, we know we have a majority renter city and a lot of those homes that were flooded are rentals, okay? And you can't just call up, you know, the homeowner's insurance company and make a claim. If you are a renter, you can still apply for FEMA assistance. I'm going to pop this kind of link in the chat. It talks about flood resources, but bottom line, your landlord has a responsibility to get the property clean and make it safe like ASAP. So if they are not doing that, the city of Detroit is ticketing $250 a day that is not done. So go on that web page, call the city, tell your landlord, we need to make it happen. If they're not making it happen, let BC find them until it happens because we just talked about mold and all those things. We can't risk our baby's safety over this. So know your landlords need to be responsible and get that property cleaned up. And if you're a sit, uh, elder or just you know, can't can't get things, it's hard cleaning up flooded properties, right? The city of Detroit is offering assistance. If you can't do it, it's just too much. Call the city of Detroit. They're sending volunteers out to help elders and help people with disabilities get their properties um, cleaned up in a safe shape. So check that out. August 9th is the deadline also to apply for FEMA assistance. So take pictures, document, get all the resources you can. So as I hop off, just take all those links. No, it is a trying time. It is. But there are pockets of resources available. <laughs> and hopefully they can be pulled together to keep you in your home. Okay. So thank you, Tanya. Thank, thank you, you so much. And thank you for those flood resources and especially the resources related to renters. Um, as we close out today, uh, please make sure. Thank you, Tanya. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in the situation of eviction, the eviction moratorium ends at the end of the month. So please make sure you take advantage of the resources that um, are in these links. And if you need help, please reach out to any one of the organizations that are part of the COVID-313 um, coalition. Um, so thank you so much. Remember to vote. It's uh, on August the 3rd. Um, and uh, Chaz is having their 5K on Saturday, August 14th at 9 a.m. And this 5K is for kids. Uh, it's the Kids Superhero Run Walk. And so I think a, uh, a, um, a link is being dropped into the chat right now so that you can register for it. And we're gonna drop in the chat one more time, the flood remediation. Uh, and and so that you can access those resources. Remember that we have these, if you didn't catch the links or you're watching this when we're not live, um, please just reach out to us via Facebook and we can get you in to where you need to go. Thank you all so much for joining us today. Remember to stay healthy, stay strong, stay empowered, have a good one. Thanks everybody. And. I forgot to tell everybody to turn their cameras on. So if y'all will join me in saying goodbye to everybody. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> See y'all later.